This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. When it's game day for your health coverage, trust Farm Bureau Health Plans to draw up a winning play for you. They've been backing Tennesseans for nearly 80 years. So pleased to welcome Coach Brian Callahan in. Rested, ready to get back at it. Yeah, can't wait. Good time with the family, a little time off. A little time off, a little time to reflect, a little time to study. Uh, and then now, ready to roll. All right, so was it hard to let it go more as a head coach than it was as an assistant coach? Much harder. <laughs> much, much harder. Uh, I, I never really let it go. I did my best for my wife's sake. Um, but, yeah, there's just so many other things you think about. And uh, even when I was coming back to Nashville and, you know, I'm watching games and, you know, my anxiety is all the way up. And I just – I'm like, all right, hey, we got, I got to get home. I got, I got things to do. You know, it's just – I can't help it. It's just what it is. But then you think about watching around the league and the messaging and what do you – it's just, yeah, there's a whole other lump of things that I thought about this year that I normally wouldn't have thought about. I bothered a guy on the plane because he had red zone on his phone, and I was, like, leaning over. Oh, no. It was really kind of embarrassing. You might. Uh, yeah. It's that too was me, much. though. I, I was the red zone, the the red zone <laughs> creeper. Yeah. It's too much. <laughs> just watch a movie. Just watch a movie. No, he had the game. I mean, and he, and he had Indianapolis, Jacksonville. Oh, so, I'm so like, you really cared. Okay, don't, don't turn it. Don't turn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. Well, Coach, you were able to get back to work, <laughs> yeah, actually, and do work. your job. Um, had practice today, got everybody yeah. on the field for a little bit more than an hour. What was the main focus of today's practice? Uh, just get guys back moving around. You know, they they we played Monday night. We didn't do anything Tuesday. I mean, obviously, we got back at 3 in the morning or whatever it was, and then uh, they came in for their normal post-game operation Tuesday evening, and then really I let them go for the rest of the week because – Hard to bring them in Wednesday of a bye week. They've already had – that's the, really their off day. It's two days after the game. It's always where they're the, usually the most sore. Um, so they haven't done anything in, in what amounts to almost a week. And so today was about just getting them back in, moving, running, kind of getting back into routine. They'll have their normal off day tomorrow, and then we'll start our normal rhythm Wednesday. But today was just about slight introduction to Andy, more just getting back in the physical rhythm of practice. You made clear in your press conference that – when healthy, Will Levis is your quarterback. You had intimated that he wouldn't probably do a lot today. How much do you need to see from Will this week to feel comfortable playing him against Indianapolis? Uh, that he can that he can perform as as normal without you know any reservation. And I think um, we'll see how the practice week goes. But um, I think day by day he'll feel better and better. Uh, that's generally how those things work, you know. And it's been he got an extra week on top of it, so. Hopeful and optimistic that he's ready to play Sunday, um, and then we'll just we'll see how it goes. He's if he if he has any reservations about being able to to make throws or feel good about taking a hit, all those things, uh, then we can evaluate it then. But it'll be a feedback from him on how he feels and if he can perform uh, to the level that's required to play quarterback in the NFL. Before the staff broke, you did a self scout for the month of September. Was there anything in that that stuck out to you that really surprised you, or? Something that stuck out that really didn't at all surprise you? Um, no, I had a pretty good grasp. I think it is good when you step back and you have some gut feelings on some things, and usually those gut feelings tend to be pretty accurate, and then you are confirming essentially as as you go through it. But still a pretty small sample size. Uh, four games is not a lot, but found a lot of areas for me personally that I felt like I could get better um, as a play caller, as a play designer, all of those things I think – um, can help put our guys in a better position. That was my biggest takeaway was we're, we're through four games. We're, what can I do better to help these guys? And um, that was probably the biggest thing for me. But there's certainly we, – we watch all the tendencies and, you know, run pass tendencies and formation tendencies and who's on the field and what do we do when they're on the field. So all those things uh, we take into account. But uh, still been a pretty limited sample size to get a huge – take away from that usually it's six seven weeks eight weeks gives you a little better picture all right so since we have a moment coming off the bye could you please fully explain what happened on Miami's and I wrote down how to call this Miami's (laughs) onside free kick attempt with their punter what were the Dolphins hoping was going to happen there uh my best guess is that they were they tried we used to call it a, a moonshot punt um sometimes we would over years, different places I've been, if you had a punter that could hit that ball, what they try to do is hit it as high in the air as they can. 
uh, and make you have to try to manage and catch it uh, because you know you can fair catch it and all that, but it's more about fielding the ball. Um, that would be my best guess uh, without knowing exactly what they were trying to do, but they tried to hit a very similar style, you know, pop up punt where you have to field it. Um, I would say in, in full transparency that from where I was standing, I couldn't tell where the setup zone was. Um, and so that's where you saw Colt, I think, get as, as frustrated as he was because we couldn't quite tell. I mean, I think it landed on the 47. When you're at the field level, that's pretty tight. It's hard mm-hmm. to see uh, where that was. But it took, to Quan's credit, um, and really I think he did a really nice job of understanding the rule, knowing the, where the setup zone was, where the ball had to land. Because um, it would have had to land. It couldn't go beyond the Miami 45, right? That is correct. Okay. Yeah. 25 so yards. You have 25 yards. It's different than the – there's still – on an onside kick, there's still a landing zone, and but they refer to that as the setup zone. So the ball has to hit on an onside kick in the setup zone, which is why you have to declare an onside kick. So then it has to hit in that, in that same uh, – in that yardage demarcation. Just like when you kick off normally, it has to land in the landing zone. If it's short of that – um, you know, obviously it's a, it's a penalty. So that was a very confusing process in the moment. I, I think there was one other kick so far this year that was a, after a safety kickoff declare. So there was all, you know, there was not a lot of sample size, but, um, again, I think Quan really had a pretty good feel. He knew what was happening. He knew where the ball had to land. And you can see Tyler Boyd is at the first level and he is standing on the, 45, and as long he can, he's not supposed to back up past the 45. And that's where Quan was there to field the ball. Now, I wasn't aware that you still, no matter the um, whatever happened to the ball, it was a, it was dead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even if it wasn't past that setup zone, I wasn't sure. I was unclear myself on whether or not because nobody'd seen it, right? Yeah. Whether or not that ball was live. The answer is no, it is not. Um, but I, I would say that that was it was just such a close landing spot the 47 and the 45 and it just you know and Quan was yelling Peter because we don't anybody to touch it but really it's it's a dead ball anyway it doesn't matter um so yeah just some things that were a little confusing in that moment do you know what <laughs> Peter is no okay so oh, Pe- fair point I should probably at least no, that's, no, okay. no, that's yeah, okay no, that's okay that's what I'm yeah. here for but th- that's something actually they used to yell back a long time ago when I played when they want you to get away from the ball don't touch it Peter 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 get yeah. away from the ball oh yeah there you go that's when you, you know shout. what the good research project for somebody out there is when did they first start? It's been Peter ever since I think I've played football. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's been around for it, – that's just what – It was Peter Brady. Who's, is that, no, no, it's <laughs> not Peter Brady. But somebody out there, Google, who is Peter? Why uh, can't we talk Well, he was an like, apostle. <laughs> let's it's, figure it out. There are a yeah, lot of true. famous – uh, the, the genesis of, like, why things genesis, are called, nice what idea. they are oh, in perfect. football is fascinating to me. Like, uh-huh. even just plays – like, there's certain plays that even in our offense that have probably had some carryover to, like, the 80s – Oh, sure. Bill yeah. Walsh. But it's like, for example, there's a play that everyone has in their playbook. It's called Hank. And they called it Hank in 1982, maybe 1970-something. Who knows how long Hank's been around. But Hank was for, it was um, hooks, right? So it was, it was their curl routes and, mm-hmm. uh, that converted. Anyway, long story short. So do, do they still? They still call it Hank. A lot of people yeah. still call it Hank. Do they still call the play where you're trying to draw the other team offside by being totally still graveyard? I've never heard that one. Okay. Huh. But there's probably someone that does. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because you're supposed to you just you're, you're just supposed just to be totally still. It. Yep. yep. Yeah. That one makes <laughs> a lot of sense. I might have to steal that. Yeah. <laughs> graveyard. Oh my gosh. We're this gonna is move. what this is what we didn't see. More than you thought, right? Uh, I mean, this is what they pay us for. <laughs> yeah, you know, it really just is. all the information. But I don't know which Peter it is. That was I somebody was Google it and tweet somebody us. Somebody will. Yeah, somebody will. There's got to be an origin. Somewhere. Oh sure, yeah, there's got to uh, be. There's got to be something. All right, we're gonna move on here. Go right ahead. Are there specific players who came out of September with a lot of momentum that they can carry over into October? Yeah, I mean, I, I think our our young players have certainly and and. What I mean by young players is probably our, our J.C. Latham, I think, has had a really nice start to the season, making the transition from right tackle to left tackle. I think he's been very, very solid. Um, and you're starting to see him grow and blossom and understand what it means to play left tackle uh, in the NFL. Devondre Sweat, no question, uh, has proven that he is an impact player on the defensive front. 
Um, I think Jarvis Brownlee's performance through his his time that he's played has been really encouraging. Uh, had a really nice game against the Dolphins, and uh, you know, and Jaquan Jackson too. I mean, for the, just the return game, he's he's been steady. He's been um, he's getting a better feel for what punt returns look like, and you see him getting better kind of each week. Um, those guys have, I think, for young players to have a good start to the season has been uh, has been really good. So uh, there's other guys too. I think. Uh, Tony Pollard has been really fantastic. Um, I think Tajay has been really good still. Um, and, you know, the guys that, that Legereus Sneed and Kenneth Murray and Ernest Jones, all the guys that we brought in to try to help us, I think, have shown um, that we're really happy to have them and they've played really good football for us so far. Talk about another rookie here. You announced today that rookie linebacker Cedric Gray his window, his return to play window is opening up from uh, IR. How quickly will he be able to get back into football things to be able to show you he could potentially get back on the active roster? Yeah, that remains to be seen. We'll see yeah. how he starts out. I mean, he's been out of football activity for a while now. Um, not that he, he's been working out and he should be in shape, but just the football part, um, which is why they give you the, the amount of time they do to open a window before you have to make a decision um, on whether or not they're ready to go or not ready to go uh, after those three weeks. So for those that don't know, if after three weeks you determine that he's not ready to go, he reverts to full-time IR and then can't be then brought back. If after that period of time we can activate him, obviously it would be a roster spot, so you'd have to roster move somewhere to get 53. Um and that's the decision you have to make. But they give you three weeks to determine whether or not the player is ready for that. The Titans are getting ready to take on the Indianapolis Colts. And the Colts have made it very clear that Anthony Richardson is their quarterback when he's healthy. Now, whether or not he's healthy, we don't know. And Joe Flacco, his backup, is a very different style of quarterback than Anthony Richardson. Is this a situation where it might be extra challenging to prepare given that they are such different types of quarterback and you might not know who you're facing until pretty late in the week? Yeah, that'll be a challenge. Um, that's, you know, obviously Flacco's been doing it for a really long time and uh, his ex- his explosive play rate is through the roof and he's got the ability to make all the throws and he's been doing it for a really long time. Um, you saw what he did in Cleveland last year. My dad was with him then. So, you know, you see what he's done this year so far for Indy in, in his um, reserve role. It's It's been impressive and that's what you expect from a guy like him that's played uh, the amount of football he has, and then you have the whole dynamic with Anthony Richardson with the with the quarterback run game and his ability to move. It's it is very different styles of quarterback play, um, and so you have to sort of have a plan for both, uh, and then you still have to have a plan for their, for their offense in general, the receiving crew for sure. Um, they've done a really nice job through the early part of the season offensively. I mean, it's a it's an explosive offense. They have good players, and really either quarterback that has played has found ways um, to score points. And so uh, we got to work cut out for us, I think, on defense. This will be a, a real test. Hey, Titans fans, with a Kroger Boost membership, you'll score big with double fuel points, free delivery, and lots more. Go to Kroger.com slash boost for details. Kroger, official grocer of the Tennessee Titans. Tighten up. Home is at the forefront of all that we do. It's why we're so committed to caring for the places and spaces in which we work and live. Ashley, the official furniture provider of the Tennessee Titans. We continue now with Titans head coach, Brian Callahan. Regardless of who the Colts end up playing at the quarterback position, they have a lot of receivers who are just phenomenal. Josh Downs, Michael Pickman, Alec Pierce, A.D. Mitchell, all of those guys are going to put a lot of pressure on any opposing secondary, right? I would say so, yeah. It's it's a good group and uh, a homegrown group on top of it, guys that they've drafted, they've developed. Um, you know, I was I was with their offensive coordinator, Jim Bob Cooter, at two different places, both in Denver and in uh, Detroit. I worked for, for Jim Bob, and uh, Shane and I have some crossover. Shane worked for Mike McCoy, who I worked for for a long time in Denver. So there's some there's – some, familiarity and offensive scheme and how they like to do things. Um, guys that have always uh, watched their tape and, and been impressed by how they use the players they have. Um, and they've done a really nice job of acquiring talent at the skill positions. Uh, I think their tight ends are good players too. I think they've had some injuries, but um, it's it's a good group from top to bottom in the skill positions. They got four real receivers um, that can come in and make plays and they find ways to get them the ball. And it's, you know, evidenced by the explosive play rate that they have and their ability to score touchdowns from far out um, is is impressive. And they, again, you, you have, then you add the element of, of Anthony Richardson and his ability to run. It's a whole, it's a, 
it's a lot to, to prepare for and get ready for. Gus Bradley is their defensive coordinator. They didn't have a great day on defense yesterday in, in Jacksonville. That's true. But Gus has certainly been successful in his career as a defensive coordinator. When you go against a Gus Bradley defense, where does the challenge start? Um, it's generally always started with the front, um, but they've had some injuries, which is why they're, I think their defense has probably not performed the way that they're capable of, but it's more so because they've had so many injuries. Um, those injuries pile up quick, especially when you're talking about the front guys. When they're fully healthy, that's a that's a very, very, very good defensive front. Uh, both the linebackers play the defense well. They know the rules. They play within it. They're fast. They tackle. Um, you know, their secondary is where they've got some – they've gotten banged up and they're young – the corners in particular, but um, they're a disciplined defense. They do not give up explosive plays. Gus has always been on top of that. Um, they've they've really keep a, a roof on your down the field passing game. Um, he does a really nice job of mixing up. He's a simple scheme in general, but he's got enough wrinkles to keep you off balance. Um, they're they're primarily a a single high team, but they play all, they mix in all the other things too. They, they still have all the, and then just when you think that Gus is going to play four down and not pressure you, here comes a bunch of heat that you might not have necessarily anticipated from the get go. So they have, he's, he does such a good job of keeping you off balance, uh, as an offense, both schematically, um, and then, and with the, with the, with the rush has primarily been how they've uh, over the years have been that style of defense. So, Good coordinator, veteran coordinator, knows what he's doing, knows how to knows how to call a defense, knows when to change it up. Uh, a lot of respect for Gus. Always been been pretty pretty good battles every time I've, I've played against him. So uh, looking forward to that challenge. As the Titans get ready to take on the Colts, you are about to start a stretch of thirteen straight Sunday games. Which of the twelve of those games that we know the time of? 11 of them are at noon. The 12th is at 1 o'clock Pacific time. So, again, pretty consistent. Does that consistency help this team maybe as they continue to improve and try to find their rhythm and grow? I think so. When a schedule came out and I saw that, I, w- I was thrilled. I mean, to be able to go play at the same time every Sunday for weeks at a time, that you get into a bit of a rhythm and um, there's not a lot of disruption to your weekly schedule, not a lot of disruption to your – uh, rhythm of getting ready for a game. So yeah, I think it's it's rare. I've not had that happen very often, and and hopefully we're we're playing in a lot more primetime games in the future. But uh, I will take that, and and that should work to our advantage. Hopefully, as the season goes along. But thirteen straight weeks of playing football on Sundays, so not a lot of appreciable time off in there. Coaches always vary practice schedules as the year goes on. Do you have to look at maybe doing that even earlier, knowing that with the early buy you're going 13 straight weeks? Yeah, there's. I had a fact. Tom Jones and I talked for a long time the other day about how, how and when do we start adjusting the practice schedule? Um, being this is you know going into week six for us, you know where does that line is that earlier? Is it is it you know do we stay the same for a little bit longer because we had the buy so we're still pretty fresh and and our schedule is designed to keep our players fresh anyway and i think that's worked so far pretty good for us um but yeah there will certainly come a time when you have to make adjustments whether you're cutting some reps you're cutting some time off the practice cutting some time off the day you know because this gets long it's a really long season and so you got to find ways to keep your team fresh both physically and mentally where it's not like the the drag of the same thing you know for 13 straight weeks, you got to find ways to uh, mix it up a little bit for them. So yeah, we'll we'll definitely be moving things around, shortening, adjusting. You know, probably sooner than we would normally because of the buys early timing. Since we're coming off of a buy, let's talk about some league wide trends a little sure. bit. First off, the dynamic kickoff. We talked about it a little bit earlier in the show. Overall returns are up 12 percent. What are your thoughts on the new kickoff? Um, I think it's been what they've anticipated for the game. They wanted to, you know, essentially the kickoff was a dead play um, prior to the start of the season. I think over the last three years, there's hardly any returns. Um, and it's an exciting play. I think people like to see it. Uh, I think it's an advantage if you have good returners or you're good, you're a good special teams unit. It's got you have an advantage. Um, but it's it's been, I think, what has been um, hoped for is that it adds a little bit more excitement. The play becomes a viable play. Uh, so all those things – factor in. I think some teams are probably hitting more touchbacks than they are return are returning hitting returnable balls, but um, I think overall as you say it returns are up and I think that's what the intention was. 
All right, the Texans yesterday, they didn't have much time left, but they seemed very comfortable playing for a 59-yard field goal, Mm -hmm. which they made. So it worked out really well. They beat Buffalo with it. Um, This has been the philosophy around the league, teams playing for what back in the day would have been record-setting field goals. Um, From your football mind, when you hear – the Texans seem to play for a 59-yard field goal attempt at the end of their game with Buffalo. Does that still sound crazy, or is that just? I mean, that's a long that's a long kick for a, that's a long kick for any kicker, right? Um, but I just think you're seeing the accuracy and and um, depth of made field goals continue to increase. I mean, these guys are are high-end athletes they they hit the ball they have power and they can get velocity on the ball and they can get it up high enough fast enough and uh, yeah I mean some of these kickers are remarkable at what they do and I think that's showing that you, you're feeling comfortable hitting a, a 59-yard field goal to win the game I think it was very similar ending in uh, the Cincinnati Baltimore game right. where mm-hmm. you know Cincinnati gets the turnover and they're, they're at a 53-yard field goal and and run the ball kind of three times knowing that that's a for Evan McPherson that's a that's a walk in the park for him. We mm-hmm. might have seen that before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. But those are the things I think you're just – the talent of the kickers in this league I think is um, – I think it's only going to get better. I mean, it's, these guys are hitting from almost 60 regularly. It's If you got one of those, it's a real weapon. Brian Callahan, as always, thanks for joining us. You got it. Thanks for having me. Hey, Titans fans, SeatGeek makes it easy to find tickets so you can be a part of all the touchdown celebrations this season. Whether you're buying or selling football tickets, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek is the official primary ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. The most disruptive idea in ticketing, a ticket that works. Expect the expected. SeatGeek. (laughs) SeatGeek. Made a rookie mistake this football season? Maybe you should have had a Snickers. Because now you can enter for the chance to turn those rookie mistakes into prizes, including a trip to Super Bowl 59. Visit snickers.com slash rookie mistakes for details. Coach Ron Rivera joins us now. He is an NFL network analyst. You can see him on Good Morning Football Monday through Fridays at 7 a.m. and on GMFB Overtime, which streams Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. Central on the Roku channel. And it airs, actually, you probably didn't know this, here in Nashville at 1 a.m. Central on the Nashville CW. There you go. Coach, thanks for joining us. Well, I appreciate it. It's good to be here. Let me ask you a question. You Okay, you played – Nine seasons with the Bears, you won 105 games as a head coach, but the media thing, didn't you do some media right after your playing career ended for three or four years with WGN? Yes, I did, Uh, Mike. Actually, what happened was when I first got out, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I had done some radio and and television as a player, you know, just kind of – the Bears were hot, and it was easy to be on TV. It really was, and, and it was easy to be on the radio. And so as I kind of started doing it, a couple of people told me I had a knack for it. Um, and so when I retired, actually Sports Channel Chicago reached out to me initially um, and got me started. I did a couple of things um, doing some, some college football, um, and then I did some things for WSCR, and then it eventually ended up with WGN uh, doing some stuff for them both on radio and television. Uh, and it was something that I, I enjoyed, but it really wasn't football. And the truth of the matter is, the one thing my wife said, and, and it made all the sense to me, is, you know, you miss the regimen of, of getting up early, going to the facility, you know, doing those things. And that's what really kind of got me going as far as coaching was concerned. So after 30 years of being in the National Football League, as a player since 97 and as a head coach since 2011, now really taking that step outside of the league and seeing the whole thing. Do you like that now at this point in your career that you're not in that regiment that day in, day out anymore? You know, I, I still get up at 5, 5.30 in the morning um, and just can't help myself. It, it, it's, it's been ingrained, and, and so that's kind of hard. Um, and, it, and I do miss the regiment. I mean, I drive my wife crazy. She sends me out of the house to, to do some stuff that I really believe she's just making up to get me out of the house. <laughs> um, so, 
I do miss it. Um, I do enjoy the fact that doing some stuff for, for, for the NFL Network has, has really kind of helped me. And, you know, I'm going to do some stuff for Westwood One coming up. I'm actually on Thursday. I'm going up to Seattle to, see, to, uh, to do the Seattle uh, 49er game. So uh, that'll be exciting as well. And, you know, it's kind of funny is, you know, I've kind of taken after one of my old coaches back in the day. But the beautiful thing about Coach McGinnis was he did it while he was coaching. And, and so I've kind of learned a little bit from that. And, uh, you know, I, I know you guys are in the, uh, in the Dave McGinnis studios there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's get to football. First month of the season, defenses mm-hmm. have dominated opposing passing attacks. But what happens this weekend? Thursday, Kirk Cousins throws for over 500. Through the games of the weekend, more and more 300-yard passers. So – have the offenses and the passing attacks specifically finally caught up with the defenses as we get to October? Well, you know, it's interesting because when, when we, we started the season out, I kind of thought there was going to be a resurgence of the running game, partly because if you look at how some of these defenses are built, they're all being built to stop the throwing game. Um, and so you got lighter players out there. you got more DBs on the field. Um, so it was it was set up to run the football, in my opinion. And we saw that in, in, in the first four games. You're right, though. This week five kind of turned out to be a little bit different. But I also think certain situations necessitated that. And that is when teams were stocking up for the run, now what happened was it opens up the passing game. When you only see those single high DBs back there, you know, single high safeties, now the offenses start going to their automatics. They're checking and they're throwing the ball vertical or they're hitting a seam, and next thing you know, it's a big play. Early on, it was in vogue to play some form of cover two, whether it be cover two, quarters, trap, whatever, to stop the passing game so people ran. Now you see things happening in a different fashion. A great example as far as <clears throat> that's concerned is you look at the commanders. You know, what, what, what they're doing with their young quarterback, for the most part, has been brilliant. And what's happened is teams are playing a lot of zone against these guys, And they're trying to keep their eyes on the quarterback. Because of that, the receivers have more cushion. They have more opportunity to get open quickly. Thus, Jaden's been, he's been throwing the ball, getting it out of his hands. And his receivers are making plays once they've caught the ball. So now teams start tightening up against them, playing a little bit more man. And what's happened? They're running the ball better. Okay. And that quarterback's running the ball much better. Why? Because DBs, they've got their backs turned them. So it's it's a little bit of give and take. And and as you go through it, offenses that recognize what the defense is trying to do against them sooner are the ones that are having a lot more success. So, Coach, we've been sitting here through the first month or so of the league or of the league year saying, oh my goodness, look at all these running uh, running teams. Look at this commitment to the run game. And what you're saying is that we're we're stumped by it when in reality it's a response to what defenses are asking of offenses. Is that correct? Right. It, it's yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a great point because it is about what they are doing, but who they're doing it with. When you're putting five and six DBs on the field, and as an offense not trying to exploit that, you're making a mistake. And you see a lot of these teams reacting to that very, very quickly. That very, very first running play uh, against last Sunday night's game against Buffalo and, and Baltimore was a trap play. It was, it was a too deep look. They made a quick trap block down with the, with the tight end and the wide receiver who, who both picked off a linebacker and a safety. And Derrick Henry was on the cornerback in no time. And the cornerback had to try and make a tackle against a very physical running back who popped it and ended up going at 78 yards for the touchdown. And that was a reaction. That play was a setup. They got exactly what they wanted from the defense and they exploited it. Coach, parody is here in mm-hmm. the month of October. This is an amazing thing, and I don't know if it's happened before, but I just noticed it. 14 AFC teams have two or more losses. 13 mm-hmm. NFC teams have two or more losses. Are you even a little surprised that there's no more separation than that just five weeks into the season? Well, what's interesting, too, has been the matchups. I mean, take a look at who's been matching up with who. Are we seeing all the all, all the really, really good teams, you know, of the past playing against all the really, really good teams of the past as well, and the mediocre teams are playing against each other? And if you kind of look at who's been playing who, I think that gives you a little better, uh, better insight as to is there parity or not. 
some teams who have good records have played some pretty mediocre uh, schedules already. But when you get into the meat of it, you get into the thick of it, now it's going to change. It's gonna be, I think it's going to be very interesting. I really think this month it's going to really shake out who the, who, the, who the contenders are and who the pretenders are. Coach, you were a new coach in 2011, so you're a good person to speak to this. What are some of the challenges that Brian Callahan has faced in his first month as a head coach? And maybe could he have anticipated them? Maybe how will he learn from them going forward? Well, you know, I was one a couple of weeks ago to, to say I thought he handled the situation with Will Levis during the game, okay, a little emotionally. But then he came back, had an opportunity to gather his thoughts. He probably talked to his father, who I think is really one of the really good offensive line coaches in this league and a very good football coach, period. Um, so when, when Bill Callahan and Brian probably had a conversation about how to handle it, how to better handle it, uh, then he got up in front of the media. He owned it. He talked about his desire and his passion to win and his expectations. And that's important because, again, if people understand why you do things as a head coach, people begin to go, oh, I see what he's doing. And you also see that emotion that tells you the commitment and the desire to win is very, very important to him. I mean, it could have been very easy for him to just blow it off and not say anything, you know, just because he's the head coach. But he's learning those things. And he's going to learn how to handle those emotions. You know, he's going to learn how that, you know, when, when you focus just on that, sometimes it distracts from other things. I mean, he's going to be a really – I think he really is going to be a really good coach just because he's, he was brought up in this in, in, in the NFL. And he understands what it takes to be successful because you can see it by the way he's trying to get these points across to his players. All right, Rod. So one of the things as a head coach you have to get used to is the camera is on you on the side. <laughs> Sean Payton is certainly used to that. Yep. We saw in Sunday's Denver win over Las Vegas, the head coach of the Broncos and his rookie quarterback, Bo Nix, had a little thing, let's call yep. it. We saw it. It was a blow up. Uh, after the game, Sean Payton said that he needed to get the Ferris Bueller out of Bo Nix. Now, you were in Chicago <laughs> when Ferris Bueller came out. Yes. Can you translate? exactly what that means to get the Ferris Bueller out of Bo Nix? Um, well, I don't want to put words in the coach's mouth, but, um, you know, from my perspective, it really is more about the casual approach to things that, 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 Hey, things are going to work out. We're going to be fine. Trust me. And doing it his way. I think that's a little bit of what coach was trying to say. And again, I don't want to put words in the Sean's mouth because he really is a very bright and very successful football coach in this league. So, but that, that's, the, that's how I took it was that, you know, Ferris Bueller, I remember, I love the movie myself, very casual, cool, calm approach, and then did things his way. Well, Sean has got has been very successful in the style of offense he's run. Shoot, I had to compete against him for nine seasons um, when we were head coaches together in the, uh, in the NFC South. So you get a, a respect for what he does. And I think Bo is just learning some, some really hard lessons. But what I do love is, you know, Coach made that commitment to him. He's, he, he's, he's going in, giving this young man an opportunity to grow. A team, you start to see as things start to happen and good things are happening. You see them start to rally around one another, especially rally around this young quarterback. So I think that's the messaging he's trying to get to his kid. Cam Newton was your quarterback in 2011 as a yep. rookie when you were a rookie head coach. How is managing a rookie quarterback different in 2024 than it was in 2011? You know, I'm not sure if it's that much different. I really don't. Um, maybe the off the field things are things you've got to deal with and handle a little bit more, but the, you know, the X's and O's of the game are there. Um, it, it's funny because and I've had this conversation with a lot of other uh, guys that have coached and played in this league, the expectations of the current player compared to the expectations of when we were playing and when we were being drafted are completely different. Those expectations are through the roof. If you're taken in the first three or four rounds, you're expected to play now. You're expected to contribute now. And if you're a young player and you've just gotten a brand new contract, you're expected to live up to every cent of that contract. And so it, it, it is a product, I think, of all the social media out there, all the opportunities to have a voice and opinion about players. And that's one of the things that we as coaches that we have to manage with our current players. And that was one of the things that, you know, I had to try and get across to our guys. Hey, man, fellas, you got to understand something. All that stuff out there is interesting. But what's important is what we're going to do on the field. So let's focus on what's important, not what's interesting. 
Now, Mike brought up Cam Newton, so I've got to continue on with a Cam Newton question. The Titans are going to see Anthony Richardson at the Indianapolis Colts twice this right. year. And he is considered to be the Cam Newton comp. Mm -hmm. Do you agree yep. with that comparison? He is, um, except for one thing about Cam was, was Cam – understood how to protect himself and not take the great big hits. Uh, Anthony is, is, is a young man that, 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 that plays with his hair on fire on, on occasion. And he just, you know, you just wish he would take a little bit better care of himself. And Cam was really a physical player. Um, and, and again, he knew how to take the hits. And, and that's something this young man's got to learn because, you know, his team needs him on the field. And that's very evident because when, when he's rolling, doing the things that he's capable of, he's probably one of the closest comparisons to who Cam Newton was for the Carolina Panthers during his stretch. We continue with Coach Ron Rivera from the NFL Network. We want to ask you about a few teams before we let you go. Amy, you start with the first. I guess we'll start with the Cincinnati Bengals. Are you surprised that they are currently sitting at one and four? Yes, I am. I mean, that's a, that's a football team that, that has had a lot of success in the past. Probably one of the things that you, you could be a little concerned with is obviously has been their uh, lack of consistent running game. Um, you know, they've got the quarterback. He's dynamic. He can get the ball and spread it around all over the place. But again, one of the best friends a quarterback can have could be a good running, a running attack. Defensively, they've started a little bit slow as well. But also look at who they've had to play too, though. They, they've played some pretty good teams early on. And so they've suffered the brunt a little bit of that. Now they're starting to get into that, uh, as I said earlier, you know, the, these, these, these average teams playing against teams that we thought were going to be, you know, uh, leading the pack right now. And so it's going to be interesting to see if, if those things don't correct. I mean, you're starting to see it with Jacksonville. Things are starting to correct. Houston's really stepped up, uh, you know, had a big win the other day against Buffalo. So it's, it's kind of coming all to form. I mean, there are some teams that have had to play against some really good competition and have shined, and there's other teams that are just, again, you know, they're going back and forth with, with, with teams that kind of sit and fit in their, uh, in their category. Why are the Houston Texans 4-1? and one? I, I think a big part of it has to do with, with their style of play. Defensively, they're very physical, very aggressive uh, defense. You look at them offensively, and again, this is a quarterback-driven league. When the quarterback has assumed that position on your team as, as, as the leader and the playmaker, um, as a guy that can manage games and then make plays when they need to, that's when you'll see teams start to take off. Because um, this really is about the, this quarterback, the quarterback in the NFL. I, I really do believe that. Um, I think that quarterback plays a big part of who they are and their identity. Um, they've been a lot of fun to watch. They really have. I think D'Amico Rimes has really shown that he has a good feel and understanding of what this team can be. And he's trying to get it across to his players. I love, you know, they win a big game. They break it down. His guy, hey, this is just part of it. The work's not done. Well, let's go back to work. I mean, he has the right approach, and I think his players have all bought into that. Everyone is talking about Detroit right now, and the Lions are 3-1, yeah. and one, but they're not even leading their own division. Minnesota is 5-0. and oh. Is that a huge upset to you? No, um, because Minnesota's been there all, the, all along the last couple of years that, you know, I, I, I think what, what, what Coach has done there has been tremendous. He's come in and he's had a very good quarterback in Kirk Cousins. And then all of a sudden, he, you know, Kurt leaves and he finds Sam Darnold to make the draft a quarterback who hasn't had an opportunity to play. But Sam Darnold has stepped up with the opportunity. And it speaks to, again, the growth and development of a young player with high expectations that just didn't live up to him. Things settle down. The pressure's off. And now he's connected with a guy that has an offense that spits his ability and he has worked with this young quarterback, and he's seen him every moment protect this 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 young quarterback. And again, I say young. He's what in four years. He's, he's in his fourth season already, but he's still a young guy. I mean, again, the expectations can be so unfair, and the criticism can be uh, you know un unfair as well. And you know, you wonder what's the situation, circumstances for a player like a Bryce Young, who came in as the number one pick ahead of C.J. Stroud. C.J. has success. He doesn't, and the comparisons won't stop. So this has been very interesting as far as the development of young quarterbacks too. Look at this year's, you know, with, with Jane Daniels and, 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 and Caleb Williams, you know, Daniels has come off, started fast. Caleb started slow, uh, didn't play very well against the Titans. And, 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 and if Will Levis doesn't turn the ball over that, you know, uh, they don't allow a, a punt to get blocked and return for a touchdown. You know, that's a different game. It's a completely different game. And so there's a lot of reasons for why things have happened. All right. NFL.com article says this. I'm dying to hear your reaction. 
NFL.com has rookie Jaden Daniels as their current rookie of the year favorite. Yes. And their current MVP favorite. Too much too soon? Um, not necessarily. Uh, I, I think what he's done, and he has re-energized a franchise. Um, believe me, I know I, I was there for a while trying to get things going. Um, but he's done a nice job. He really has. And he's got to be given credit. Cliff Kingsbury got to be given a lot of credit as well. And then Dan Quinn for what he's done as far as leadership, as far as that team is concerned. But has he? it, it should be in that conversation. Absolutely. And this is why. A lot of times the best friend of a young quarterback is a running attack and a good, solid, stout defense. Okay? Their defense has played well. It hasn't played as good as it can or should. And the defense has been feeding off of the energy that he has brought. The rest of the guys on the offense are feeding off the energy he has brought. Okay, they run the ball well because they run the ball well. He's included in that running game, okay, as a big part of it. It's opened up the rest of the offense. If you And one of the things that, you know, I'm doing, one of the things I'm doing at NFL Network is I'm tracking the, the growth and development of all the starting rookie quarterbacks. And I wish I'd, I'd realized we were going to get on this because I, I have some great notes. But a couple of notes I have as far as tracking them, all of his numbers are above and better than the league average in most categories. Okay. Snap to release is the quickest in the league. Okay. Um, accuracy of throw is, 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 is near the top, at, but it's better than the league average. Uh, his play action success is better than average. I mean, you just go on and on, and a lot of it has to do with the type of offense that they have. A lot of their throws are quick. Get the ball out of your hands. Don't sit back there and hold it. That's part – in all honesty, that's one of the things that I, I saw with Will that's kind of helped, you know, the, the, the minus nine turnover ratio. And that is because he holds the ball a little bit longer than he needs to. Thus, the pass rush is getting his face a little bit, you know, a little bit. He's getting pressure a little bit more. But it's part of his own undoing. We went through that last year. Sam Howell, good young quarterback, was learning. But anytime Sam held the ball, it created pressure, which created something bad to happen on occasion. And that's what you see with Will. Will's need to make those decisions. He'd be very, uh, very decisive a little sooner, and he can get that ball out of his hands. It'll help his offensive line. Offensive line is getting a lot of criticism. I'm not quite sure if they really do deserve it. They've done some really good things with their running game. And when they have been able to – uh, protect the quarterbacks because the ball's getting out of his hands sooner. So that's one of the things that I noticed just, you know, from, from afar and getting a chance to watch it. I think Coach Callahan's plans are great. I love his protections. But, again, the quarterback also has to make decisions to get the ball out of his hands. That's what you see Jayden doing up in um, uh, up in Washington. He gets that ball out of his hands, and everyone's talking about how great the offensive line is playing. Well, a good part of it is what they do. It's a good part of what they do running the ball. And it's a good part of what the quarterback is doing in decision-making. Coach, we could talk to you about football all day, but we have one more topic that we have to touch on before we let you go, and that is Coach Mack. Dave McGinnis <laughs> was your linebackers coach for your yep. last seven season, and he tells us often about his 30-year career in the National Football League. 30-plus years, I guess I, I think I've heard say. that. Yeah, it, yep. it's getting I think up he there. brought that up. Yeah, he's mentioned it a time or two. You were three, there for his very first year. What do you remember about Coach Mack as he entered that linebacker room? Well, let me tell you what. The Iceman, <laughs> and that was his nickname. No. Well, that's – you know, the movie Top Gun came out. Oh, yeah. And he always oh. wore those – he always wore the aviator glasses and had his head back, hair, hair back like they did in the movie. So, right <laughs> away, um, one of the linebackers, I, I believe it was Otis Wilson, called him Iceman. And the nickname stuck. So he became the Iceman. And so whenever, you know, he was around, that's, that's what it was. We just, you know, we all had, and everybody had nicknames. You know, my nickname was Chico for, for, from, the, from the TV show Chico and the Man. A lot of people thought I looked like Freddie Prince, and I was always standing around Buddy Ryan because uh, Buddy always had me with him because, you know, he was, he was trying to teach me, gro uh, groom me, show me how to work things. So we're always walking around. There goes, hey, there's Chico and the Man. So it stuck with me. <laughs> Um, I mean, we I mean, we had we had some very colorful ones in our in, in, in our uh, in our locker room. And, and it was really cool. big O for Otis Wilson. And, you know, uh, Wilbur Marshall was phenom. I mean, we just we had a great room with Coach Mack. He was a young guy that really assimilated very nicely into our locker room. He 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 he, he got our respect very quickly. He coached us all very hard. 
And after he wore you out, he put his arm around you and builds you back up. I mean, that's what a coach is, is there for, is, is to teach you the ropes and it's got to coach you the way he believes you need to be coached. And he understood us all. So believe me, I'm very grateful for everything I learned from Coach. Uh, we, every now and then, we'll cross paths. It's always good to see Coach Mack uh, because I tell you, the Iceman, was, he was really cool. I see what you <laughs> did there. The That's nice how you did that. But <laughs> yeah. Let me just wrap up with this. So he's now considered one of the preeminent analysts, color commentator, whatever yeah. you want to call it, in all of NFL radio at this point. If he went to TV, he would be too. Are, are you any bit surprised that the guy you knew nearly 40 years ago or starting nearly 40 years ago could move from coaching so easily to oh. this role? No, not at all. It doesn't surprise me one bit. I mean, his personality and who he is, um, first of all, is, is, is terrific. It's the right kind of uh, personality you need, I think, to, to, to endear your listeners, to catch their attention, to, to, to get them to lean in to listen while you're talking. That's him. But what's really interesting about it, too, I also think he'd be a tremendous politician. I really do. I think that's a guy that could could, could, could run for mayor or governor and, and be very good at it because he does care about people. He, he's very sentimental about folks. Um, you know, and, and it really showed because he took a lot of pride when we had success. You know, when Coach Dick gave me a game ball, one of the first people to come over and, you know, just put his arm around me was him and, you know, and just pat me on the back and everything like that and said, then don't let it go to your head because, you know, Coach will cuss you out in a second. <laughs> I mean, that's him. But, but you know, it, so it doesn't surprise me that, that he is having the kind of success he is now painting the picture. Coach Ron Rivera is an NFL Network analyst. You can see him on Good Morning Football Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. on NFL Network and GMFB Overtime, which streams Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Central on the Roku channel and airs at 1 a.m. Central on the Nashville CW. Coach Rivera, thank you so much for the time. Oh, that was great. Hey, uh, one, one, one quick, quick thing real quick. Um, it, it's really kind of one of the neat things that you guys do in, in, in Nashville as far as, you know, you have this, this tremendous community that really gets behind the team. And, and, and I really think the direction this team is headed, finding our identity, creating their identity, I think is going to be really special. So, again, just hopefully the fans will continue to stick with these guys, give them an opportunity to, to really grow and develop, because I, I do think it is a good opportunity uh, for this football team. Thank you so much, Coach. All righty, guys. Thank you. For Coach Ron Rivera and A.B. Wells, I'm Mike Keith. Thanking you for joining us for the OTP. 